want to hear what God has prepared for us and to speak to us today from the second book of Timothy is our youth pastor, Pastor Edwin Joy. I should say Reverend Edwin Joy. Serving 
as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the crown except by competing according to the rules. The unworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the one who will give you insight, insight into all this. Apostle Paul is about to be beheaded by Emperor Caesar Nero, and he penned down the book of Second Corinthians, uh, sorry, Second Timothy, to encourage his protege of this case, Timothy, to continue furthering the gospel. Paul is aware of the false teachers that are surrounding uh, Apostle uh, Timothy. Ephesus is a city where all sorts of things are happening. False teaching, remember the Artemis, the temple of Artemis, uh, full of gross immorality, was located in Ephesus. And the young man by the name Timothy is surrounded by all manner of things. And Paul is aware Timothy is a human being and is weak. He is timid and is susceptible to giving up. And uh, in this passage, Paul admonishes Timothy by telling him, my son, be strong, get him, please. my son, be strong in grace that is in Jesus Christ. He tells him that these things that you have heard me say, and trust them to reliable people who are also qualified to teach others. Be strong. Not confiding in their own sufficiency, but in grace that is in Jesus Christ. Tim must be strong. Timothy must not rely on his own strength. He should not rely on himself. Paul says again, when I am weak, God is strong. For the power of God is made perfect in our times of weaknesses. He knows who, by relying on the grace of God, Timothy will manage, but he cannot do it by himself, but he can only do it by fixing his eyes unto Jesus. Now, we find the same encouragement and during the installation of Joshua's ministry, in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse number 19, after Moses, uh, sorry, verse number 9, after Moses and gone, the Bible says, God is telling Joshua, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go that God is going to be with him wherever he is going to go. God encourages Joshua to be strong and courageous as he leads the children of Israel to the promised land. He's telling him, Joshua, that the antidote of being weak is being strong. Paul is aware that there are many factors that will impede Timothy from doing what he should do best from preaching the word, from the spreading of the gospel, and Paul is admonishing him and telling him that Timothy, you need to be strong. And to ensure that the gospel is perpetuated, we look at three things from this passage that Apostle Paul is talking about. From verse number one to verse number seven, Paul is talking about the commitment to the gospel. The commitment to the gospel. From verse number 8 to verse number 13, 
Paul is talking about the constancy of the gospel. The constancy of the gospel. From the verse number 14 to verse number 26, Paul is talking about the characteristics of the gospel vessel. The, uh, the, the commitment to the gospel, the constancy of the gospel, and the characteristics of the gospel vessel. Now, Paul is telling Timothy, no one serving as a, a joint means suffering like a soldier in verse number three, like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Not, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please the commanding officer. He's telling Timothy that you must endure hardships like a soldier. In other words, a soldier never quits. A soldier gets tired but keeps going. A soldier endures to the end. He is on the battleground. He never gives up, but he is always looking forward to please the commanding officer. And then, Paul is telling Timothy, never quit. It is very hard. I understand it's not easy. It is not a walk in the park to spread the gospel and to live like a Christian, but you must endure hardships like a soldier. That you must be strong and courageous like a soldier. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 4, verse number 8, verse number 9, we are unpressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. For we, those who know they are God, shall be strong and do exploits. We never quit, for we are the children of God, and we have a commanding officer surrounding us to give us strength even when the journey is tough. In verse number uh, five there, Paul is telling him, similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the crown of, uh, the, the crown except by completing according to the rules. Now, he's comparing this journey of spreading the gospel with an athlete, that an athlete must run according to the rules that are set. We must again, as children of God, and as, as, as people to perpetuate the gospel, that we must run according to the rules that are put. Rules are not easy. Everybody wants to break the rules because following the rules is actually not easy, but Paul is telling Timothy that you must run according to the precepts of the scriptures, striving to live a life that is free of sins. He must run knowing who is, who is he representing, that he must know his team, and as he run, he must run not endless, but he must run towards the finishing point as a great team. Team, you can give me a clip of an athlete. That's going to be the case. Kaki is tracking him. Then comes Kachos. Here comes Borzakovsky, ranging up down the outside and taking much closer contention. Borzakovsky looks as though he's come to these games in good shape. And they take the ball at 51 seconds. 51 seconds. That's a lot faster than you saw in the heats. But this is well within him. 51, as I said, he's run 45-5. Is he strong enough for the rounds? Radisha leads and looks strong. Borzakovsky, though, is on his shoulder. Then comes Kaki, and then comes Simmons, the American, moving up into fourth place. Yego, silver medalist two years ago, is trying to get into contention. Kachok, the pole, is coming wide from the back. But with 200 metres to go, Radisha leads from Borzakovsky, but he's not put this field away yet. And it could still be that the Russian might have the speed in his legs. Can Radisha kick again from the cup from the front? Kaki is desperately trying to stay strong in third, but here comes Radisha kicking off the bend, and 
Bozikowski cannot go with him. It's going to be a goal for Kenya and a goal for David Radisha. Bozikowski weakening, but Radisha crosses the line in 143.91, and he has that major championship goal. Amen. The question is that who is going to celebrate him? Are we not going to run this race of serving the rules and the disciplines that are put as a Christian? So that one day God is going to come and say, Good and faithful servant. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12, verse number 1 to verse number 13, the Bible says that therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us draw off all that aid us and sin that easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked for us, fixing our eyes unto Jesus who is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endures the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. That we must learn like an athlete. We must observe the disciplines that are put. It is not learning anyhow. It is not learning aimlessly, but we must learn always looking at the finishing point. And God is going to applaud us, is going to appreciate, is going to celebrate and say that this person ran according to the rules. Again, Paul is saying to Timothy in verse number six that he must be diligent like and patient like a farmer. The Lord is keeping the records and willing to reward those who faith faithfully and do her in his service. We must do the will of God before we receive the promise. Most of you know very well that the farming or being a farmer is actually not easy. A farmer needs to be very diligent. A farmer needs to be very patient. He doesn't really plant today and wait for it to germinate tomorrow. He must wait if the crop has to take three months. He can never go after two months to harvest. He must go after three months after this crop, uh, this crop has gone through the maturation period. A farmer is very diligent. A farmer is not a lazy person. My mom is a farmer. And I can tell you my mom toils. Sometimes I, 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 my mom comes to Nairobi and she can't stay in my house for more than two days. She just, the first day she comes and tells me, remember my chicken, remember my coffee, remember my tea, you know who is going to take care of them. I am going to hire from who is somebody who is going to do it. But she wants to be there to supervise her work. I remember in primary school, we were, I was, we were actually cultivating and uh, after around 11 a.m. I gave up in, because I was so tired. And uh, my mom actually chased me away from that chamber with stones and told me, get out of this place, you lazy guy. And I had to just go home because I'm interfering. I'm lazy, I'm interfering with the product, you know, in what is expecting at the end of it all. Because a farmer needs to be very hardworking. A farmer needs to be very, and there is no room for lazy farmers. They are not going to receive the harvest in food. In Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 6, the Bible says that you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you receive what God has promised. That you must be committed to this gospel like a soldier, like an athlete, and like a farmer. It's not easy, but you must be this kind of a person who is always observing this, uh, being, uh, uh, this kind of a person who is like a farmer, who is like an athlete, and who is like a soldier. In verse number 8, 8 to verse number 13, Paul again knows that there are many things that can impede Timothy from spreading the gospel. And here, as we have already seen, that Ephesus is full of false teachers. But Paul is talking about the constancy of the gospel. The constancy of the gospel. And Paul is saying, looking back, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. 
that Timothy, you have to look back unto Jesus, who is the author of your salvation. And Paul is telling you, even when we are chained, even when we are rejected to look at Jesus, uh, we, even when we are rejected, we must look at Jesus, who is the anchor of the faith that we profess. Because Jesus lives as one who raised from the dead, he remains a sure sign. Jesus could not be confined by death and so the good news about Jesus Christ cannot be confined by persecution or shame. Amen. That he rose again even when they rejected him, when they persecuted him, that Christ rose again and is a sure sign of our salvation. And that's why we have received that salvation. It is one man by the name Alexander Grosse who said there is more safety with Christ in the tempest than without Christ in the calmest waters. That it is better for you to have Christ even when things are rough, even when you can't see the future, even when things are going away, it is better to be with Christ than than being in the comfortable zone without Jesus Christ. The point is telling me again in verse number 10 that there is an element of reliability of the one of God. In verse number 9, sorry, the reliability of God. And Paul is saying that the one of God cannot be imprisoned. The one of God can never be changed. They can kill the messenger, but they can never kill the message. They can persecute the messenger. But the message will still remain. Meaning that our God is unchanging in his character. His will and his covenant and his promises never fails. Our God, even in times of trials, is one Yeshua. In the book of Luke, chapter number one, verse number that seven, the Bible says, For the one of God who will never fail. And God says that I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. As a Christian, it does not mean that we are immune to challenges. But one of the things that God is promising us, that He is going to be with us even in times of our diversities. He says again in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse number 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In the book of Psalms 119, verse number 89, the Bible says, Forever, O God, the one is firmly fixed in heaven. One as if we that the one of God never changes friends. No one can change the one of God. The one of God is always absolute. Amen? Amen. The one of God never changes. One plus one is two. And no matter how we do, people try to distort the one of God, the one of God is very constant. And Paul is also saying again in verse number 11 to verse number 13 and talking about the faithfulness of Christ. It is the truth to trust all this thing. For if we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God is always faithful. He never changes. Even when there are transitions and changes in Sidam, God never changes. A church will continue. For he says what? That for, you know, you know, you build a church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And the church is not built by men. The church is built by God. He remains as sure he is always faithful. He is saying, even when you are feeling bad there, that some of our pastors are living, that the changes are happening. When you are feeling that you are suffering inside, Paul is telling Timothy, my own suffering and confinement cannot restrict or punish the legacy of his faithfulness. Amen. Our negative action, faithlessness, will not be displicated by
by faithless or blind part. He remains faithful and he can never deny himself. Christ must remain faithful to his own self, to his character, and to his commitment. He never lies. He is always faithful. He remains constant in terms of his promises. He says what? You know, my promises are yes and amen. Amen? And great things will still happen even after one day Pastor Joe will be gone. Amen? Even one day when the transition is taking place, actually, the word of God will still continue because it's constant in his nature. But in verse number 14 to verse number 26, we see the characteristics of the gospel vessel. And what Paul is saying, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the leads to the ruin of the ears. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately eldering the one of truth, but avoid wandering and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. And their talks will spread like gathering. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of others. The fact foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. One as if we stand. And everyone who knows the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Now, in this passage, Timothy is mandated to preach the word of God at a solemnly or solemn church. Not to wrangle about words which are useless to ruin the ears, but to avoid the empty chatter that will lead further to ungodliness. And then Timothy is questioning, because uh, with my wife, uh, they wrote to him. He said, you know what? These things belong to God, and what they belong to God, let it come and be sanctified. <laughs> Go still there do one manner of things and think that God is going to do magic and sanctify their own actions. The one, the one of God is always, should be reliable and is constant. Bible, someone by the name Michael Johnson said, you cannot believe in whatever, in, you, sorry, you can believe in whatever you like, but the truth remains the truth, no matter how sweet the lie may taste. You know sometimes, you not know sometimes, I have actually overcome. Uh, but when I used to be caught by the policemen out there, and, uh, when I am actually driving in the wrong place or trying to overtake here and there, or trying to drive at high speed, sometimes policemen, they normally use another speed type like of mother that tells you to consult with your adversaries. <laughs> you are taken to God. <laughs> and some of us look at that scripture, but against the word of God, it still says, do not cry. <laughs> and some of you just come and look at that scripture. So if you are actually not crowded with the word of God, you end up succumbing and saying, you know what? I did what was what, what is right. Bribes out there. You want to get a job. You can't be patient like a farmer, but you want to use your own dubious ways instant gratification to get that job. But I can tell you it will never last. It is temporary. But whatever God gives, it is permanent. One as it is. Whatever God does in your life is actually permanent. Because the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. Our responsibility is not to come to call a common crowd with the false doctrines, but to rightly define the one of God. He gives examples of two people, Arminius and Philetus, who are allowing this, uh, who are distorting the truth of God. They are allowing 
the truth, distorting the truth. And this false doctrine's policy is spreading like a gangrene. It eats like a cancer. Allowing the seepage of ordinary sewer of ideas to pollute the streams of truth. So in verse number 14 to verse number 19, Paul is saying you must be observe biblical fidelity. In verse number 20 to verse number 21, Paul is saying that there must be purity in fellowship. You must be pure in fellowship. The Bible says, now in a large house, they are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of gold and other women, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctifying, useful for master, preparing for every good work. Now, if you look at uh, the New American Bible Standards, uh, Bible Standard, in verse number 14, it talks about being a useless vessel, or it talks about uh, it talks about language uh, with one which are useless that leads to the ruin of Eras in verse number 21. It says that being useful to the master, prepared for every good work. In the book of Philemon, chapter 1 of verse number 11, it says that formerly Philemon, formerly Onesimus, was useless, but now is useful. One as person. And what this passage is saying, that not us to remain as useless vessels, but to remain and to be useful vessels. That God is able to turn our uselessness to be and we can become something that is useful. Now he talks about gold and silver and wood and earthenware. They are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Now, in my house, I have a wife, and uh, this wife of mine, this she has uh, some vessels of honor, <laughs> and those vessels of honor, she keeps them until when the visitors are going to come. <laughs> this, this is not a cup that we give Nathaniel to just play with it. <laughs> This cup, even when we are feeding him or giving him something to drink with this cup, we must hold him. <laughs> because it is very useful, you get me? It is uh, not something that we treat like, oh, it's not ordinary, you get me? But this kind of a cup, it is words. You can do anything, it is in the sink, you can find it at the balcony, you can find it on top of a carpet. You can actually anywhere you can put it, you know, because you see, and this is what the Bible is saying that in the house of God they are useful. They are ignoble and ignoble. <laughs> God. Jesus. Of 
friends. You know, oh, pastor, who's the word? They see them, who's the word? They go online to write their other stuff out there, complaining about everything that the leadership has made, decisions that the leadership has made. They should not be done and done that way. You know, they are actually causing chaos. Actually, I'm the ones. Rampering ones, catastrophic ones, ones that are ruined in the house of God. But vessels of honor are come and collected. Amen. The vessels of honor, they are ready to do what is biblical, what the Bible, what the word of God says. Amen. Friends, what is telling Timothy? That the first exhortation is to be faithful to biblical interpretation and do not get up to conversation that sucks your conviction out and spills lies to the one of God. The Bible says in the book of Psalms 1 that blessed is the man who walks in the council, who will not walk in the council of the wicked, and stands in the way of the sinners, it is the it is and or sit in the in the seat of mockers. But it lies in the law of the Lord and meditate the law of the Lord day and night. The noble and the noble vessels should not hang together. The plastic cup and the melamine cup, they should not be in the same place. <laughs> you must seek to be a vessel of honor, a noble vessel. In now you conduct yourself, in now you can, in those people that you work with, in those people that you associate yourself with on everyday basis, ensure that they are what? The vessels that are known. In verse number 22, Paul is talking about the purity in living. He tells Timothy, now free from the youthful lust and pursue righteousness, love and peace, which with those with who call on the name of the Lord from pure hearts. The purity of art, free from lust, very similar to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 6, verse number 11, that says that free from the love of money and follow after righteousness, that we must walk away from all that defiles, that we must walk away from all that that corrupts, that we must walk away from that that stains and blights. We must run away from the youthful lust, the desires that are contrary to the one of God. By the way, they are not youthful as, or they are only youthful as, because they begin with youthfulness, not because they end with youthfulness. <laughs> they are those lasts that are activated as someone becomes an adult and are so powerful and remain, and they still remain. There is another day my friend Paul was preaching to the young people and told them, whatever you don't conquer, will conquer you. Mm -hmm. And unless you conquer it, it's going to conquer you. You must run away like Joseph mm -hmm. and maintain whatever is pure, whatever is normal, and whatever is true. Mm -hmm. The craving of money, the craving of power, the desire of material things, jealousy, any way and others. Live a life of integrity. Who you are when no one is looking at you. Sometimes sin becomes sin only when you are caught. It is not sin. So long as I'm not being caught, it is not sin. But integrity demands or dictates that you should be the same person at home, you should be the same person with your spouse, you should be the same person in the church, you should be the same person in the marketplace. And the characteristics continues, and I don't have time to deliver on them. And talks about the discerning spirits by avoiding foolish arguments. And it talks about the element of gentleness and being humble. Sadiqs and Paul is telling us that we must be committed to the gospel. We must be constant and know that there is, we must keep. Knowing that the gospel is constant, you must know that there are characteristics that we need to observe of a gospel vessel. Senior pastor comes. 
just conclude the service. There's a song that says that there are, there's a race I must run. There are victories to be won. Give me power every hour to be true. I pray God will give me power to be true. And I pray God will give you power to be true. I will leave it for the truth.